Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Now we will begin the second session of the day. This session will focus on cultural. Sorry, camera has to be adjusted. This session will focus on cultural roots and maritime heritage. The session will be chaired by Dr. Nambi Rajan. He is a joint director general of the Archaeological Survey of India. In the panel, we have Dr. Uttara Suratan. Dr. Suratan is an assistant professor at Narsi Monji Institute of Management Studies in Mumbai. Along with her, we have Dr. Yumki Kai, who is a lecturer in museum studies at the University of Leicester. We also have Dr. V. Selvakumar with us. He is a professor at the Department of Maritime History and Marine Archaeology at the Tamil University in Tanzawar. Before we proceed further, Please allow me to announce a few house rules. All participants are requested to keep themselves on mute when they are not speaking. All speakers are requested to adhere to their time limits. Chair and moderator will take questions during Q&A session. Panelists and speakers can ask questions through raise hand option and by unmuting themselves when their name is called. Registered participants can ask questions by typing through Q&A link or raise hand option. Questions may be kept brief and to the point. In case panelists and speakers are facing connectivity issues, they can switch off the camera and continue on the audio mode. Let me hand over proceedings to the chair now. Dr. Nambirajan? Chair is facing some connectivity issues. Please stay with us. He will be joining us in a minute. Please, please stay with us. We apologize for this inconvenience.
वेलकम डॉक्टर नंबीराजन Dr. Uttara, Dr. Namirajan is facing some issues. So, could you start with your presentation, if I may request you? Uh, I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll start. And uh, can you share my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So while, while the PowerPoint is connecting, let me start. Um, today's talk for the next 15 minutes, I'm mainly thinking aloud about how archaeologists can engage with heritage and specifically how um, Indian South Asian archaeologists can engage with heritage as it um, um, pertains to the Western Indian Ocean. And um, it's my PowerPoint there. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Um, is has not Dr. Namija Rajan joined? Should I? Uh, yeah. uh, I have come on my mobile now. Some issue with the laptop. Now I'm connected to my mobile. Now you can see me. So we can hear you and see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to update Dr. Namirajan, because we were facing uh, to she has started. Yeah, tell me. I can see you and hear you. Yes, sir. So uh, while you were facing issues, we have asked Dr. Suratan to start with her presentation. So if we if we could continue no, with that, it would be great. I mean, please, please let them continue. I'll I'll talk to them later. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, um, so books so have long been the medium for interaction between different communities and cultures and the movement of people, goods, and ideas. There's an extremely rich corpus of archaeological research understanding the maritime history of the West Coast of South Asia and the transnational connections that shaped it. In the present, this understanding of a shared collective history that transcends national boundaries has become increasingly important as public policy debates center on the preservation of transnational maritime heritage. And this is something that has emerged um, in the discussion over the last day and a half. Um, and in the next uh, 13 and a half minutes or so, I outline some things in which a deeper understanding of both the insights and limitations of archeological approaches to maritime heritage can help inform policies and approaches to the past and the present. Uh, next slide, slide please. 
Um, I'm not even going to attempt to summarize the vast amount of work that has been done, archaeological research that has been done in the Western Indian Ocean. I'm just cherry picking a few points that I will uh, develop on over the next couple of minutes. And uh, we all know that there has been a fair amount of, um, of work investigating the history of the ocean through literary evidence, through numismatic evidence. And then, of course, there has been a considerable amount of work on the um, so-called Indo-Roman trade. And we all have all heard about uh, Arikamedu, which is a, a fascinating site. The only thing that I want to raise here is that by using the very term Indo-Roman, we are still working within almost national boundaries. We are trying to um, identify various spheres of influence even in the past. So in a certain sense, we are transmitting our present concerns onto the past. However, it is encouraging to note that there are um, there's a diversity of more holistic understandings that are rooted in regional archaeologies that have emerged. And these include a, a range of archaeological research of coastal settlements. Uh, Patanam has been mentioned, Rothal has been mentioned. There have been a lot of surveys and research along the coast of, of South Asia. Uh, there has also been a, a range of interesting material culture studies that look at the movement, the, uh, the kind of uh, origins, the analysis of specific types of material culture. There's been fascinating work on beads, on, on textiles, on different kinds of pottery. And um, I just want to raise the point because this, has, this came up, I believe, in the last uh, kind of panel where uh, this interest in trying to identify um, or understand the people who made, who, who um, participated in this Indian Ocean kind of connections. And as an archaeologist, I would like to emphasize that it is through the material culture that we can engage with the people in the past. And therefore, just by looking at archaeology, we are not solely looking at material culture. We are also trying to understand more about these connections, about the people who made and used these, these beads and these textiles and this, this pottery. And increasingly, there are uh, more and more research and Professor Jansen's um, talk I found particularly fascinating about the nodes and the connections that, that span the Indian Ocean. Uh, a few suggestions I would like to make, um, especially when it comes to the Indian coast, the west coast of India, um, there has been limited research on prehistoric archaeological sites along the coast. And that, kind of, uh, that leads us to ignore um, the fact that human engagement with the ocean uh, spanned an extremely long period of time that is not solely uh, limited to the Indo-Roman trade or even to a uh, later kind of early modern uh, trade across the ocean. In that respect, again, uh, we don't have uh, that much work in India on early modern archaeology of the early modern po ports, the, even the medieval ports along the coast. Um, another, another area that we are uh, lagging behind in is that of comparative analysis. While we do have a remarkable amount of archaeological data on specific sites, on material culture, um, on particular nodes, uh, we, um, there is a fair amount of work to be done on analyzing uh, comparative connections, on analyzing um, pottery or ceramics across cultures. Um, trying to trace these, these networks of movement. And then uh, finally, um, something that um, has come up, in fact, is that um, we need to engage more, despite the fact that as archaeologists, our focus is on material culture. We need to engage more with the knowledge traditions that went into the making of this material culture. And this includes uh, shipbuilding, navigation, fish, fishing traditions. Um, and this is increasingly important because it is part of the cultural heritage of the Indian Ocean and allows us a deeper insight into, into uh, the formation and creation of this heritage. So this brings me uh, to my uh, main point that I want to make. Um, how can archaeologists en engage with this discourse on heritage in the Western Indian Ocean? Uh, next slide, please. A lot has been written on heritage, and I am 
in this in this slide i'm just thinking aloud about heritage as it pertains to archaeology and there have been several case studies that illustrate the complex and fluid nature of heritage as a culture, cultural process and something that also emerged from the discussion of uh, on this panel is that at one level we can see it as a set of dualities cultural natural material immaterial temporary permanent tangible intangible but such an approach elides the continuities and the reality that heritage is a simple word for a much larger component of culture and this is again something uh, i feel is an underlying theme throughout this conference for example a ship on the sea for archaeologists represents the materiality and antiquity of of the ship of shipness but also it represents the craft traditions that go into its making the knowledge systems of traditional navigation the communities that live the traditions of seafaring and fishing and the very movement of people and things across the space so heritage is about all of this and none of this at the same time lived experience material culture intangible traditions all of these constitute heritage and are contingent on specific regional temporal communal and natural configurations it is a heritage is a multilayered and ever changing uh, concept for an archaeologist this definition is important because we need to recognize we, that we are not just talking about material culture we're talking about all of these uh, what has been called intangible heritage as well that goes into it so what is the unique contribution that archaeology can make not just to archaeological research per se but to conversations on heritage next slide please um the first thing that we kind of need to recognize is that uh, there are these institutional frameworks within which archaeologists and and heritage professionals are working and of course we have a uh, unesco's um, notion of outstanding and unique value and over time um unesco's definitions of heritage have become much uh, broader and much more um you know inclusive uh, for instance with the incorporation of underwater cultural heritage intangible cultural heritage and these are just uh, again as i mentioned i'm picking and choosing uh, a few themes um however something that we need to recognize is that unesco's definitions um again rests upon certain categories of tangible versus intangible and um in in the previous panel there was a mention of how um you know there is there is now this increasing definition of cultural landscapes as a more holistic and and uh, interdisciplinary term but these are tricky terms and these are some things that i argue that archaeologists uh, can can fruitfully engage with the other thing we need to recognize is that the unesco's definition uh rests upon states parties and the safeguarding of national heritage which makes it a little bit more tricky to start thinking and talking about transnationality um within within india of course we have the asi that does incredible work with material culture and the ministry of culture that again has these definitions of tangible and intangible and within this again i am not going to talk about project mosam in any detail because the next discussion will do that but i feel that project mosam has um has incredible potential as a way of engaging with this transnational heritage kind of concept and so how can we as archaeologists contribute to this to this um concept next slide please the first thing is that we have as i've mentioned we have considerable regional archaeological work and increasingly archaeologists are moving towards a comparative and trans regional approach and i would argue that this is extremely important there are challenges there are challenges in terms of the access to data language politics national boundaries but we need to think more in terms of integrated histories and archaeologies we need to think about connections shared histories even if they are rooted in specific regional concepts um and something professor jansen also mentioned yesterday i believe is this importance of precision in terminology and which is why i emphasize that while it is important to think about transnationality about connections it is also important to be very rooted in specific archaeological contexts and research because that is what gives the data that that richness 
Secondly, we need to recognize the diversity of stakeholders, voices, and claims to ownership and heritage. We need to recognize the politics of this. Um, the central question then for us is whose heritage are we talking about? Who manages it? Who interprets it? Who consumes it? Participatory practices are something that needs to be central. And I would argue that archaeologists are in a unique position to engage with diverse communities and stakeholders due to the intimate and contextual practice of fieldwork, which often includes extended periods of time living and surveying and excavating within local contexts. However, at the same time, in a South Asian concept, uh, context specifically, um, this has been lagging. This kind of uh, contextual engagement with local communities has been fairly limited. We do not have a very good track record of participatory practices, even though that's so slowly changing. And there are people who are working in South India, for example, who are working with local communities. But this is something we can and should do, starting from actively involving local st stakeholders in the practice of archaeology, working with the keepers of local histories, and engaging with the concerns that animate local his interests in history and archaeology. And in this latter, we are not giving up the, this academic quasi-objective rigor, but we are beginning to think about new ways of doing history. In fact, I see the COVID pandemic as an opportunity for us to rethink our interactions with people and not just with material culture. In a sense, we are being pushed into a situation where we are hyper aware of other bodies, their locations, their movement, their relationship to our own bodies. Can we extend this in the ways in which we think about doing archaeology that incorporates local and regional worldviews and practices? And this is one way in which we can acknowledge that our definitions of heritage might be very different from someone else's mm -hmm. lived experience. Again, archaeology and conservation mm -hmm. management is something that within a South Asian con context, we are still working towards. And once again, I would like to reference uh, Professor Jansen's um, talk where he talked about the um, archaeological park where archaeologists are thinking not just in terms of investigating the past, but also in terms of conservation, in terms of consumption, and in terms of, of uh, reflecting and engaging about that past to a public audience, which is something that I believe that we can increasingly fruitfully engage with. So the purpose of these, these broad points that I wanted to say is that with, by engaging in these, in these practices, archaeologists can provide a deeper contextual understanding to this UNESCO terminology. And we need to recognize that the UNESCO's terminology is fairly value-laden, but simultaneously vague. So we have phrases, and this I've taken from the UNESCO website, of masterpiece of human creative genius, uh, important interchange of human values, unique testimony to a cultural tradition. And we need to recognize that um, they, yes, they are absolutely correct at one level, but how exactly do we prove it? How do we prove that this is a masterpiece? How do we prove that this is unique? And one way of doing this is to think about um, archaeology and archaeologists as providing that necessary context. And here I would emphasize the importance of, of long-term research on some of these questions. And um, research, again, is something that, that necessitates a fairly long investment of time and money and energy and people. And that is something that we need to build further um, on Project Mawson. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I just want to uh, leave it open with uh, a couple of questions. Um, as I was thinking about uh, heritage and the landscape, um, I, uh, I want to talk about the fact that several approaches to heritage emphasize the importance of situating heritage within landscapes. And landscapes concepts are uh, is something that archaeologists are very familiar with. And a very interesting idea is that of maritime cultural landscapes that um, actually started in the 1970s when Westerdahl wrote about it, has evolved and, um, in, uh, and changed over time.
but broadly is uh, emerged out of archaeological research and emerged out of a need to integrate people, land, and sea. I won't go into details, but maybe we can talk about it in the discussion. But it provides a powerful analytical tool that is a more holistic understanding that can provide a more holistic understanding of both material culture and heritage, which uh, circumvents some of this compartmentalization of research studies. Um, so in terms of heritage and the Indian Ocean in particular, a landscape approach situates cultural and natural activities in space. Heritage within archaeology can then be seen as an endeavor of understanding the landscape, whether that is the landscape of the past and the people, places, things, and meanings invested then, or the landscapes of the present and the people, places, things, and meanings invested now. We are talking in a certain sense about multivocality and not necessarily uh, you know, truth, which is often contested. I leave you with two final points. Is it possible um, to start thinking about oceanscapes instead of landscapes as historians and archaeologists are moving towards integrating studies of land and sea? Can we begin thinking about a unified history of the ocean, which uh, will allow us to transcend some of these national boundaries? Um, while acknowledging the importance of people, can we formulate ideas of heritage practice where the ocean is central? And because I have talked about this multi-layered notion of heritage, can we think of heritage, heritage as a process of becoming? Things, places, nature, what have you become heritage as people assign meaning to it? And um, that is, again, part of the, of the challenge and the fascination of thinking about heritage. But this is where archaeologists are uniquely positioned to contribute a contextual approach that provides some of this meaning to um, an interdisciplinary approach to heritage. So I'm going to end here. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Dr. Nambirajan, could you take over now? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think there was a problem initially uh, with my connection. Uh, I think now, uh, what do you do? Uh, you go for discussion now or discussion at the end of the session? Uh, after all presentations are done, sir. We'll go for that. Okay, okay. So now I can invite the second speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Ian C. Kai, uh, lecturer in the Museum Studies, University of Leicester. Uh, he has got a presentation on museum politics on the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, Mr. Yungsi, you are on yes. this line. Um, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm wondering if I could have my presentation slides on, um, on the screen, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you, um, the chairperson, for that um, um, very kind introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here um, to join such an esteemed group of scholars and policymakers to discuss um, geopolitics and heritage on the Maritime Silk Road. Um, I'd like, first of all, to thank the Indian Council of World Affairs for having me here, as well as Pro um, Professor Himanshu Parbarei for inviting me to speak to you about my ongoing research. Um, as I'm still um, you know, at, the, at the kind of a beginning stage of this research, I appreciate any suggestions and comments that you have um, re regarding some of my own analysis. Um, I'd like to also thank um, um, Parai and Samkrat for putting together the online conference and for facilitating our presentation. So um, next slide, please. So this is my presentation outline. I'll first introduce the conceptual framework of heritage diplomacy, which I will draw on to, um, to analyze my case studies and to set up the objectives of my research. I will then um, you know, um, discuss my two case studies, the Chuanzhou Maritime Museum in, in China and the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, before I conclude with a reiteration of my argument gleaned from my analysis. Next slides, please. So um, first, I'll just like to explain um, the, um, my conceptual framework, um, heritage diplomacy. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so over the last decade of China's launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 and India's proposal for Project Malsum in 2014, there's been a great deal of interest in both the overland and the maritime Silk Road. So China's comprehensive um, Belt and Road Initiative is basically aimed at um, enhancing this trade cooperation and infrastructure connectivity between um, China and the Eurasian countries based on reinvigorating two ancient trading routes, the Overland Silk Road um, Economic Belt, connecting China to Europe, and 21st century Maritime Silk Road, um, connecting China um, to the Middle East through South and Southeast Asia. So um, basically, the, I think China is trying to revitalize this historical precedence mm. of the Silk Road to facilitate this formation of a new world order and a real... Mm -hmm world economy led by China based on this principles of international cooperation, harmonious coexistence and shared prosperity. So I'm going to, um, in my presentation, you know, discuss to what extent, um, you know, have they been able to do this? And next slide, please. So drawing from this emerging um, field of critical heritage studies, Tim Binter in his 2019 book, Joe Cultural Power, applies this um, heritage diplomacy as a conceptual framework to show how historical trade and cultural routes along the Silk Road are actively being revived as contemporary networks of world heritage sites and museums connecting key node cities, nodal cities on the Silk Road. And museum collections are here being assembled around teams of transnational mobilities to promote Silk Road heritage diplomacy. He argues that such um, belt and road heritage diplomacy forges new history that promotes Silk Road as a Carried out peace and um, collaboration, while Dao plays um, histories of violence, invasion, and trafficking that contradict China's um, Belt and Road rhetoric that exposes peaceful coexistence and harmonious exchanges. So, inferring from this um, concept, the mobilization of museum collections and narrative to highlight their nation's roles as nodes of connectivity on the Silk Road, as our life winter can be read as a form of strategic instrumentalization advanced by museums to promote this so-called Silk Road um, heritage diplomacy, as they then seek to, you know, um, align their narratives with the contemporary geopolitical realities in order to draw benefit from this Belt and Road um, rhetoric. Next slide, please. So in my presentation, I'm going to examine the extent to which museums mobilize the collection to a narrative to advance this Silk Road um, heritage diplomacy, um, you know, um, um, in, in, in relation to China's Belt and Road Initiative um, through the case studies of this um, maritime, um, Trento Maritime Museum in China and the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. I think um, my approach builds on my earlier study on museum diplomacy based on this um, museum exchanges between Singapore and France, um, promoted under the banner of the Singapore-France um, cultural collaboration. And my finding is that although um, the pervading rhetoric on cultural diplomacy argues that museums pursue um, cult exhibition exchange to advance um, cultural diplomacy, my research found that um, these exchanges have very limited impact on dwelling on soft power in the international stage. And in fact, museums in Singapore did not generally consider uh, cultural diplomacy as a main motivation for engaging with um, exhibition exchange, but saw such frameworks as a gateway uh, or, or funding arrangement as some um, funding opportunities to support their own programming or as political gateways to gain access to renowned museums and uh, overseas that would benefit their own mission and objective. So next slide, please. So what are the narratives promoted by these two um, case studies museums? And to what um, extent do they forge new histories that promote the Silk Road as a corridor of peace and collaboration? And are they really intended to advance um, the heritage of diplomacy as, um, you know, um, out, you know um, as outlined um, um, in relation to China's um, Belt and Road Initiative? So next slide, please. So here I'm making a comparison between the Trento Maritime Museum in China and the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, both of which are state museums which would have a mandate to legitimize state and narratives. I've also selected a museum in China and a museum outside China to understand this, how this belt and rubber is drawn upon um, by countries with very different allegiance to China. So next slide, please. 
Um, so this is my first case study, the Trenso uh, Maritime Museum. And it's initially set up in, um, next slide please. It's initially set up in 1959 to tell the story of Trenso's um, Overseas Transport Museum. And its first collection was a large collection of religious stone inscriptions unearthed in different parts of the city during the urbanization process. And these stone inscriptions bear evidence of a thriving Hindu, Christian, and Islamic communities in Trento at the height of its development as a maritime port from the 10th uh, century to the 14th century during the Song and the Yuan dynasty. And an important shipwreck was so dating to the 13th century was also unearthed um, at, at Trento Bay and that jumpstart the museum's collection of ancient ship models. So it moved to this current um, building in 1992 when the Chinese government decided to fund a, a, a new museum building after UNESCO um, Silk Road team visited the city in 1991 and commented on the importance of its um, maritime history. So today, um, there are three galleries um, which are open to the public. Um, um, as um, Next slide, please. So um, these galleries are mainly um, organized thematically based on the strengths of this collection on the uh, religious stone inscriptions and ancient ship model. Um, the, most of the collections date back to the Song and the Yuan dynasty, this golden age of Trento's development, in which Trento was a thriving maritime port, welcoming traders from medieval Europe, Arab, and um, India. And, you know, this is the um, actual Islamic culture um, in Trento exhibition, which Prof. Um, Jacqueline Amio has um, shown you some fascinating photographs. So this was set up in 2000, um, in the 2000, partially funded by a donation from a few Arabic countries to intensive lobbying by its own formal um, museum director. And the gallery showcases this Islamic gravestones found in Trento and also alluded to this um, contemporary practices of Islam in Trento today. But unfortunately, it says little about the um, persecution of the Islamic communities in, um, in, in China generally. Um, there is an, another um, exhibition, the Trento a Religious Stone Inscription, um, exhibition, which just opened in 2018, um, two years ago. It discussed at length the symbolism and meanings of this um, Hindu and Christ uh, medieval Christian inscriptions, as you can show here. But um, very little has been said about this um, practice of Hinduism and Christianity in contemporary trends or in China at large. So there is, next slide please. So there is a large, um, uh, there's an ongoing plan to relocate the wreck of this um, 13th century um, Song Dynasty ship wreck um, unearthed from Trenzo Bay in the 1970s, which is now housed in this um, special pavilion on the temple grounds of the Kaiyuan Temple, um, back to the museum. So um, next slide, please. So today, um, Trento is the second tier Chinese city that no longer enjoys the status that it has had in the 14th uh, to the uh, 10th to the 14th century. And many of these foreign communities who once lived in China and Trento have either assimilated into the mainstream um, Han population or have left areas due to persecution of minority religions in the later dynasties. However, the city and the museum got a new lease of life since the Belt and Road Initiative was launched in 2013 when 16, and when 16 historic sites in Trento was proposed for nomination as UNESCO World Heritage Sites in 2016, citing their contribution to the um, exchange system of the Maritime Silk Road and interchange of the Chinese people and foreigners in China on religious beliefs from the 10th to the 14th century. And of course, um, that's, this led to a large-scale heritization of Trento Old City, especially of the 16 um, sites nominated onto the World Heritage Site, leading to a lot of what I call the creative destruction of these sites. I think Prof. Um, Michael Jensen has brought up the process of heritization yesterday, and indeed, um, you know, that's happening in a big way in, in Trento. So this museum, um, the Trento Maritime Museum, was given a task to support the nomination of the research. So what the museum did was that they set up um, plaques and all, um, you know, um, around these um, 16 sites and did research on them. So I think, you know, the Chen Ho, um, set, um, I think that the cemetery, the Muslim cemetery that you have seen in um, Professor uh, Jacqueline Ami, Amijo's slides, for example, have now today been turned, you know, into a kind of um, a tourist attraction where you pay an mission fee to get into the um to see the cemetery for example so um you know so th there were they were th the museum is also um you know um given the task of, of actually drawing up a new exhibition on the trends of world old city to lend weight to the nomination of these 16 sites 
And the exhibition, which took a year to curate, opened its doors in 2017, as you can see here. And okay. here I, I argue that this is an example of how a museum okay. exhibition is being mobilized by the state okay. to um, an alignment of overt state objective, which um, you know aligns with this rhetoric of this um, um, China's Belt and Road um, initiative. So rather than focus on this 16 sites um, nominated on the um, World Heritage List, even though the museum was given a lot of pressure to, um, you know, just, just, you know, talk about the 16 sites, they decided to recontextualize it um, within this um, longer um, historical development of Trianzhou from the Neolithic Trianzhou to the Golden Age um, during the Song and the Yuan Dynasty. Next slide, please. But nonetheless, you know, the exhibition concluded with a next slide, please. And uh, thank you. Um, sorry, this is the exhibition that is um, actually on display on this Chenzo Old City. And if I, yeah, um, and this slide, um, the the exhibition concluded with the ongoing um, effort undertaken by the Chinese government to preserve the cultural heritage of the 16 sites. And that does not sit very well with this general narrative of the exhibition on this historical development of this old city. So here you see how, um, you know, the directive of the cultural ministry to overly support the city's nomination um, may have had an important influence in shaping the narrative of the museum. So as Chinese state museum, the Chenzhou Maritime Museum is then extended the state mandate to support this um, nomination and to support the government's rhetoric. However, the museum loca um, localizes this discourse of this maritime trade and culture exchange based on its own place history to project Chenzhou as a multicultural um, cosmopolitan city and to lend weight to the city's nomination. So histories that promote this um, um, Silk Road as a corridor of peace are privileged, whereas history that contradicts this, um, this um, um, rhetoric of peace and harmonious exchange are being downplayed. So I shall quickly move on to my next case study on the um, Asian Civilizations Museum. Next slide, please. And um, next slide, please. So the Asian Civilizations and Museum in Singapore recently underwent a revamp, moving from a geographical focus to a thematic um, um, focus on display of its collection and its new tagline, which Hello. is um, Singapore's Museum of Asia. Hello. So the first yeah. level focuses on trade, where you'll see the township wreck that um, Prof. Manchu Ray has mentioned yesterday, and Prof. Um, Jacqueline has also mentioned. And alongside the um, township wreck cargo, there is also the Maritime Trade and Court and Companies uh, Galleries, focusing on this export trade between European companies and the Royal Courts of China, India, and Southeast Asia. So the second level looks at faith and um, belief, focusing on themes of Islamic art, Christian art, Chinese scholars, ancient religion, ancestors and um, rituals. And the third level looks at material design, fashion, um, textiles, jewelry, and ceramics. Next slide, please. So at the ACM, um, next slide, please. So at the ACM, there's an appropriation and localization of discourses of the maritime trade and cultural um, exchange to project Singapore's own contemporary brand and that of hybridity and multiculturalism. So the narratives of the Riva Museum reorientate Singapore as a cosmopolitan and multicultural, multi-religious trading hub and port city to reflect its own um, outlook in line with Singapore's quest to be an open economy and a melting pot for different cultures mainly from its own economic and um, social ends rather than, uh, you know, an overt attempt to align with China's um, Belt and Road agenda. Next slide, please. So specifically, you see um, the collections are mobilized to explore maritime trade and artistic um, exchanges between Europe and Asia, resonating with Singapore's own historical and contemporary roles as a transaction center for the East-West trade. And here, you know, um, sorry, um, uh, the slide before this, um, can I go back one slide, please? Right, thank you. So here, you know, you can see a 16th century cascade made in India, you know, after European model on display, as with a buried um, shrine from Guangzhou, China, bearing evidence of Christian worship. So here in the ACM, for example, histories of, um, uh, you know, kind of um, Europe, Europe and Asia was being emphasized, you know, rather than a kind of a China-centric kind of um, perspective um, promoted by this uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. But here, you know, interestingly, histories of um, European colonization or even settlers colonizations by Chinese and Indian migrants are visibly absent from the narratives. So next slide, please. And this is the, um, I think, Tip Tang Shipwreck, which is mobilized an exemplar of the maritime trade and artistic exchange between China.
China and Arab since the um, Tang Dynasty, but criticisms of its collecting ethics and its like these are being downplayed in the museum. And here I'd like to suggest that, you know, this negative publicity on the collection in, in international media may have an unintended, you know, impact of diminishing the dual cultural power of heritage diplomacy as projected by the museum. Um, next slide, please. So that appears also to be some friction in this discourse of peaceful um, coexistence, harmonious exchange, most notably to accommodate old collections that was inherited from Colonial Raffles uh, Museum. And much of these anagraphic collections from the Southeast Asian object on display in the ancestors and ritual galleries were built upon this unequal colonial exchange and exoticization and, and essentialization of the other culture. And these are collecting circumstances which the museum is silent on. So I argue that such um, sensitized display of um, anagraphic objects are largely outstepped with this contemporary post-colonial critique of um, the museum. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. So to conclude the presentation, I'd just like to share that um, while museums draw on the rhetoric of this peaceful um, coexistence and harmonious exchange in their museum narratives, these discourses are often appropriated and or localized to suit their own um, political um, positioning and institutional agendas. And I think in the case of both museums, um, histories that promote this rhetoric of peaceful exchange are privileged for histories of colonization, persecution, and looting are downplayed. In the case of the Chento Museum, you know, there appears to be a strong state mandate given to the museum to analyze narrative to fulfill objectives of the Chinese state in relation to its own Belt and Road um, Initiative and to its own UNESCO World Heritage Site nomination. However, the ACM, um, the rhetoric um, of um, transnational mobilities and culture exchanges being mobilized to serve the agenda of Singaporean government to position Singapore as a multicultural um, city state with open economy for its own economic and social benefit rather than in alignment with China's um, belt and road um, kind of initiative. However, um, here we can also see that the propensity to advance the road cultural diplomacy is somewhat also complicated by this negative publicity on the um, Tang Shit Red Collection and the exoticization of the other um, in the representation of this colonial collection. So in both cases, I've shown how really, you know, this overarching focus on this uh, power and efficacy of the Belt Road um, 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 heritage um, diplomacy at a conceptual level tends to overlook this um, um, contextual and local operational realities faced by the museum. And which may render this, um, this efficacy of this heritage diplomacy much more ambiguous and complex. So I, I suggest that to understand the power and efficacy of Silk Road heritage diplomacy, I think there's a need to consider these local contexts faced by the museum, um, you know, in advancing this so-called um, rhetoric. So with that, I come to my end of my presentation and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Dr. Namirajan, I think you will have to unmute yourself. It seems you have muted yourself. Dr. Namirajan, are you there? Dr. Namirajan, could you speak? Are you there? You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can see, I find one name. My apologies to you. Can you can hear, hear me now, now, I suppose. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my apologies, apologies to you. If I pronounce, pronounce your name wrongly. wrongly. Dr. Yes. Uh, how do you pronounce your name, please? Um, um, I, in, in the, I live in the UK and work here. So um, in the UK, people call me Yunsi, which I'm very happy to um, kind of, um, you know, use. But in my, my Chinese name is Yunsi, and that's where I'm from Singapore. Yes. And that's where um, most people in Singapore would call me. 
but I do research in Malaysia where, you know, in, okay. in Malay, um, C is pronounced as Ch. So if people call me Win Chi, you know, you know, uh, I'll be happy to, to kind of, uh, you know, acknowledge that too. Okay, thank you. You had, you had a nice uh, presentation. Uh, now I would invite uh, Dr. Sela Kumar. Is that online? Yeah, I am online. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, welcome, Dr. Selma Kumar. Uh, you can go ahead with your presentation. It's a very long title. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, the title is Early Historic Interactions Between the Tamilgam Region of India and Afro-Eurasian World as Evidenced by the Early Textual Sources and the Contemporary Relevance of Maritime Heritage. Uh, Dr. Selma Kumar, please uh, carry on with your presentation. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And uh, I am very glad to be part of this uh, conference on uh, Indian Ocean Interaction and uh, Project Mosum related uh, discussion. Uh, today, uh, I am going to talk about early historic interactions of Tamilakam region uh, with the afro eurasian world and the contemporary relevance of maritime heritage. Before going into the presentation, I would like to thank the uh, organizers from ICWA, uh, Professor Himanshu Prabhare, uh, Professor Madhu Balla, and uh, Pragya Pandey for uh, inviting me to make this uh, presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, cultural interactions in the Indian Ocean uh, region started in the prehistoric time and it became very intensive in the uh, Harappan times. And my focus today is on the early historic period, what is known as early historic period in India, roughly between 500 BC to 300 uh, CE. And uh, my focus is mainly on the Tamilham region, mainly in the uh, uh, state of uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala. Uh, and if you look at the evidence categories and archaeological sites, we know very clearly there was an intensive movement of people, urbanizations which were governed by the processes collectively labeled as proto-globalization. And this was very vigorous somewhere from, say, 300 BCE down to uh, 300 CE. But uh, these activities continued in the latter period. We have uh, early medieval interactions and medieval interactions and pre-colonial. We have a lot of evidence. If you uh, 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 scan across the coastal regions of India, we have numerous sports and a lot of material culture, which has not been researched enough. In addition to that, we also have the fishermen uh, uh, fisher folk communities forming a, an important uh, role in the maritime activities, especially along the uh, coastal lines. Therefore, we have to undertake a lot of research to understand the maritime interactions in the uh, afro uh, eurasian world. Next slide, please. So in this paper, I, I am um, trying to survey some of these concepts related to the afro eurasian world. And then I am uh, moving on to the textual and archaeological sources for the afro eurasian world interactions with the Tamilakam, mainly southern part of India. And then I am also discussing about the contemporary relevance of maritime history and heritage. Next, please. Uh, so the, my focus, as I said already, it is in the early historic period. And uh, with regard to the cultural spaces and spheres, uh, I think we need to be more, uh, you know, more clear. And the conceptualization of long distance interactions is an important factor. Long distance exchanges and cultural interactions in history are investigated from different levels, themes and perspectives. In Indian context, most often such linkages have been studied from bilateral perspectives such as Indo-Roman, India, Southeast Asia, and India, West Asia, perhaps because of the simple binary thought structures that are associated with the superficial levels of human cognition, and also because of the tendency to focus on the dominant narratives of interactions. Although bilateral perspectives are determined by the contextual requirements and the discourses dictated by the political compulsion, of international relations, they may not be holistic in approach. Mm -hmm. Similarly, 
the trade route oriented or prestige goods oriented perspectives such as silk route maritime silk route or spice route or the oceanic perspectives of indian ocean exchange which are influenced by specific ne- or, or narrow discourses do not convey a holistic or inclusive nature of the early interactions from a relatively neutral standpoint and tend to remain as dominant perspectives while the bilateral or binary or and the micro regional perspectives are justifiable in specific contexts and requirements the concept of afro eurasian world interactions appears to offer a holistic and systemic framework for understanding the processes which are at the same time uh, while at the same time allowing the incorporation of regional or sub regional interaction spheres as subsystems thus within the afro eurasian interactions several spheres such as the indian ocean excuse me western indian ocean india southeast asia silk route and maritime silk route could be conceived and investigated however bilateral and thematic approaches do have relevance from specific standpoints or requirements my argument here is we need to visualize these interaction as afro eurasian interactions and within which we can have multiple micro uh, regional spheres like western indian ocean eastern indian oceans and also bilateral perspectives that are dictated by uh, various pers- uh, various uh, factors so that is a, a, my main argument so we need to visualize this and also we need to uh, try to incorporate of african connections that have also always been ignored therefore when we uh, conceptualize this as afro eurasian so we are trying to be holistic so within which we have ample scope for studying indo roman and also india southeast asia that is the main argument that i am presenting in this slide next slide please yeah this is the map that uh, conveys the idea of afro eurasian world so we should try to visualize this as one uh, region so when we want to study indian history we cannot just confine to the region of india at one level we can focus on the indian landmass at another level we need to look at the whole afro eurasian landmass as one and try to study the interaction only by complementing two, these two different approaches we will be able to achieve some kind of closer to objectivity that is my argument here next uh, slide so these are the uh, textual sources that are available here my focus is today is on mainly on the sangam tamil literature sangam tamil literature is generally dated around the early centuries of the common era we have lot of uh, greco roman literature as i have listed in this slide in addition we have lot of sanskrit literature i am not going to go into those uh, texts because it's a vast uh, task so i am taking the sangam literature for today's discussion an important point that emerges from the sangam lit- teacher is the concept of tinai where they have divided the land into kurunji marudam mullai neidal palai and mainly the neidal tract was visualized as the coastal and ocean scape and if you look at the class uh, gram tamil grammatical work of tolgapiyam it beautifully lists the activities of the coastal region mainly the neidal tinai where the fisher folk and the traders live and the activities as fishing and maritime trade so this particular dimension very beautifully brought out in the uh, sangam text which i'll be focusing later on next next slide please yeah this is the pitugarian table map that uh, suggests the connectivity across the uh, entire um, the indian ocean region and also you can see sri lanka and lacus musris and the site of musris here next please yeah these are the research by various scholars we have uh, from the work of uh, momington wheeler and later you know several researchers including hp ray and roberto tomber they have contributed uh, to understand the early indian ocean interactions i'll not go into the detail next please so uh, when we look at the early research we do notice certain colonial perspectives in which they try to downplay or probably because of the lack of evidence the role of indian merchants and indian traders were underlined but recent research that has been conducted and also excavation they have amply revealed the act 
active role of the Indian merchants. We have a lot of inscriptions and a lot of materials, Indian ceramics found all across the uh, Afro-Eurasian world. And what is needed is we need to look at those materials. There are a lot of excavated sites with ceramics and other materials lying across. They have not been studied yet. Only when we meet a scholar who has ex excavated a site in Egypt, we tend to understand. We need to undertake a scientific uh, study on these uh, on all these materials. Another important point that I wanted to highlight is we need to move from a single site oriented approach to a landscape oriented approach as pointed out by Johnson in, in his presentation this morning. So, uh, so till the 1990s, Arikimedu was a very dominant uh, uh, site and only that site was focused. Now we have numerous sites like Bernike, Kamchip, in um, uh, uh, Thailand and also this uh, Kororori in Oman and Patanam in Kerala. So in fact, we have a number of sites and we need to move our approach from a site-oriented to landscape-oriented. So the entire Afro-Eurasian world has so many sites that need to be studied. We need to undertake more collaborative research projects and mainly scientific studies of material. That is uh, very important when we study ceramics and glass beads using scientific technique so we can ac accurately identify the prominence. That is very important for understanding the networks of uh, connections and linkages. Next, please. So, uh, so current interest in the post-colonial uh, milieu is the rise of Asian powers, mainly India and China and other nations, and also because of the changing um, power relations with the Indian Ocean, there is more interest on the cultural heritage and cultural heritage can in fact be used as a powerful tool for building relationships. Next. So in this uh, section, I'll focus on the evidences related to Tamilaham region and I have several slides. I'll quickly go uh, the, through these slides and then finally come to the relevance of maritime heritage in the context of the project uh, Mosum. Next, please. So we have a lot of beautiful references to Yavanas. Yavanas are one categories of pe people mentioned in the Sangam literature. We also have reference to Yavanas in the Sanskrit literature and the inscriptions. Here I have taken up the references to the Yavanas. Uh, Tamil uh, literature has beautiful references to Yavanas. And one particular reference is in Paditu Patu talks about uh, the Chera king catching the Yamanas and, and uh, tying their hands behind and pouring ghee uh, on their head. This is a, an, a reference occurring in a later context, but it definitely points out that, uh, that there existed conflicts, conflicts between the political powers and the traders. That is a very important aspect that we need to look into. When you minutely work into the Sangam literature, uh, dig the information into the um, uh, poems and words, we are able to understand a lot of information. In fact, we have not properly worked on the Sangam text because there are several poems containing a lot of information. If you minutely excavate these words and their meanings, we'll be able to understand. So this particular uh, reference is very important. When we look at the literature, there are numerous references of people moving away from their villages, going to faraway locations and leaving their uh, lady love in alone and they are longing to earn the very rarely earned wealth. So that depiction is found in the Sangam literature so frequently and also there are references to kings sometimes retrieving these uh, rare wealth and they are controlling the network. For example, if you take a poem uh, 343 of uh, Pranaanuru in the at the site of Musiri, uh, which is identified with Patanam now, the Chera king was controlling the network and he was uh, controlling the resources that came from the hill and also came from the sea and he was distributing to the people. So that idea is very beautifully uh, brought out. Next. Uh, we also have reference to Yavana warriors and their characteristics are described. So poems are one important sources. So, you know, they help to visualize. When we excavate archaeological sites, we are not able to understand the minute aspects. So this uh, uh, literature, literature across the Indian Ocean can really shed very beautiful light on the 
activities that were uh, uh, happening in that time. Mainly, we have evidence for these Yamana warriors being employed in some of the palaces of the kings. And uh, that is one important uh, information. And even the fierce eyes of the uh, Yamana warriors and the well-built nature of the uh, these people are mentioned. When we talk about Yavanas, it could be anybody from the Western world. We cannot specifically say whether it was a Greek or Roman people or other people. So we should take it as a, a common category referring to people from all across the West. Next, please. So Yamana ships and vessel, Agnanuru poem 149, very beautifully refers to the Yamana ships uh, that came to the town of Musri with uh, gold and returned with pepper. We also have uh, illustration like this, this particular ship, Graffito, that was excavated at the site of uh, It This particular ship has been compared to the Mediterranean ship type. So when we look at the material culture, we see a lot of transformation in the early historic time, clearly suggesting the uh, long distance connection having a great impact on the maritime activities. Next, please. So this is another important uh, uh, graphic representation, a uh, non-local iconography, what I would call here, this particular image uh, uh, represent a person probably looking African in um, appearance, holding an aphora in the hand, and opposite to that, this person is probably a lady. Opposite is a male holding a lamp which resembles the menorah, seven-branched menorah lamp. This was excavated from the site of Adhan Kulam near Ramanathapuram, which is very close to Rameshwaram. So these kind of uh, material culture definitely indicate the long-distance connection. It is not only the Indians who went uh, out, also Yamanas and other peoples who came to India, that is very beautifully represented in the uh, literature also and also in the archaeological material. Next, please. So the, this is a, these are some of the objects excavated from uh, Patanam. What you see on the left is an ornament component resembling an amphora. On the right, you have Fortuna Intaglio excavated at uh, Patanam again. So very beautifully, the ideas, how the ideas and uh, you know goods have moved across the Indian Ocean, uh, and that is evidence through these material culture. Next. So this is a Corellian um, uh, object, a rough out, uh, that was worked at the site of Patanam. You get a lot of material culture. Next. Yeah, uh, Tarka is glazed pottery found at Patanam. Next. Uh, again, Roman coins. We have evidence of Roman coins reported all across uh, India. Next. I'll uh, skip. I'll not uh, dwell much upon. Again, Tarka is glazed pottery. Next. Uh, West Asian pottery with bitumen coating. Next, from Patanam, from the site of Patanam. Again, the same pottery, torpedo jars with bitumen coating on the interior. Next, amphora uh, shirts. Uh, next, again, amphora shirts. Next, amphora. Next, please. Yeah, you can move on. Terra sigilletta, Italian ceramics. Next. Next, terra sigillata, Italian ceramic, rouleted ware. Next. Again, uh, this uh, inscription, this is very important. It reads uh, Samutaka. This was found at the site of Adagan Kulam, probably referring to the singular or Sri Lankan merchants. So the trans, uh, transfer of knowledge related to script was one important factor. We find a lot of inscriptions across the Indian Ocean world, uh, right from early context down to medieval time. And some of them are in Tamil, and they convey the... Uh, identity of the people, who were the traders, who were involved. In the morning, there was a question about who were the uh, people. So these inscriptions help us to identify the name of the individuals who were involved in the trade. Next, please. Yeah. Coming to the reference of the Yamanas, we also have reference to a beautiful reference to Yamana lamp lighted on a Yupa pillars on top of it. So that is uh, uh, very clear that we have uh, these objects were also uh, imported. So uh, this particular lamp shape is compared to the swan and it was atop a, a Yupa pillar that was used for a sacrifice, Vedic sacrifice. Next. 
So we have a reference to uh, earlier. We saw the amphora shirts, and we have beautiful reference to this Yamuna wine that was distributed among the by the among the elites. Especially, it was given to the Pandyan king by the beautiful uh, women. So that is portrayed in poem number fifty-six of Prananuru. Next. Yeah, we have a lot of other uh, ceramics. I'll not take much of the time. So next, please. Yeah, Roman coins are there. Next, please. Yeah, uh, rulited ware and other ceramics. This particular ceramic is very important because it reveals the Indian connections uh, right from Egypt down to Vietnam. And earlier, it was thought to be a pottery of uh, foreign uh, Roman origin. Later on, XRD analysis by Gokte has proved that this particular pottery was produced in Gang. Brahmaputra Delta, and such kind of scientific studies are necessary to understand the material culture. So this can really retrieve the context uh, of the networks and how they were connected, from where the goods were uh, produced, how they were distributed. Next, yeah, the, these are some of the uh, Egyptian sites, mainly Bernike and Kuser Al Khadim. They have produced important uh, ceramic evidence related to Indian trade. Next. Uh, at this site, they have found uh, uh, Bra uh, Brahmit Graffito at uh, uh, Kuser Al Khadim. Uh, one reads Panai Ori, another reads Kanan and Sathan. See, these three names are very clearly uh, uh, Indian in origin and very clearly Tamil. And you find parallel for these names in Sangam Tamil literature. We have reference to Chathan, we have a reference to Kanan, Kadialur Urutiran Kananar, and also Panai Ori. So these uh, inscriptions clearly fix the identity of the people and uh, that they, they were coming from. Tamil Ham region. So such kind of inscriptions can tell a lot of stories about the identity of the travelers, sailors, and the supporting staff. Next, please. Uh, again, these are some of the Indian pottery found in Egypt. Next. Uh, again, this is from uh, Bernike, where they found seven and a half kilo of pepper, and again an inscription reading, Kotra Puman, again a Tamil name, clearly suggesting that the Tamil traders were involved. Next. Yeah, Bernike, we have a seven and a half kilo pepper, coconut, and uh, uh, rulited bear and Tamil Brahmi inscription clearly suggesting the connections with the Indian sites. Next. Yeah, we have another important finding from the site of uh, Korori in Oman, where there is this name Nandai Kiran is found. This name Nandai Kiran is typically Tamil. This, this is broken. It must be Kanandai. When we look at the later uh, literature, as well as medieval inscriptions, we are able to understand this name was a Kanandai. It could be the uh, clan of this particular person and whose name was Kiran. So the, this was found as on an amphora. Similarly, at uh, Bernike also, this inscription was found on an amphora, clearly suggesting these people were carrying this amphora. Probably these traders went there and they wrote their name and they were moving across. Next. Yeah, this is another uh, touchstone, gold touchstone that was found in uh, Thailand. This reads a uh, Purum Patan Kal. So clearly suggesting that these uh, traders were moving into Southeast Asia. Probably this person was a goldsmith and he inscribed this na uh, name on the stone, which was used for touching the touching and uh, you know checking the standard of the uh, gold. So this uh, this is an important find. This is this dates to third or fourth century CE. So this is one important evidence indicating Indian connection. Next. That's so the, from Fukotong, where they found another uh, uh, Brahmi inscriptions. I'll I'll not take much time. I'll move next, please. Yeah. yeah. Sri Lanka. We have evidence from Sri Lanka for the script. Next. Yeah. Political control of the trade. We have evidence for uh, kings or uh, the vendors controlling the political. Uh, activities and also controlling the navigation and commercial activities. We have a reference to Chera King uh, controlling the movement of ships that offered gold. So that is there in one of the uh, uh, poems, Sangam poems. And in addition to that, we have reference to Karikalan who was controlling the goods that were imported to the port of Kaveri Kumpatinam. Next. Yeah, so when we look at these sites, we clearly understand it is not just one site. So entire networks of sites and landscapes 
of Tamilagam where we find a lot of uh, uh, evidences and uh, these sites, some of these sites have been excavated. So we need to work uh, more on these sites to understand the pattern of the trade. Next. Yeah, transformation from the Iron Age and early historics. Definitely the new economy uh, that was brought out is displayed in the literature very beautifully where people sometimes show contempt for this new wealth, uh, which was as much as Musubi. That is what uh, we find in the Sangam literature. So the attitudes of the people, the outlooks, they are also reflected in the uh, literature. Next, I'll move on to the final section. Uh, so uh, the ports and networks, Patina Palai reference, this is very important because yes. this presents the, the, yes, please. Uh, yeah, in in the two minutes. One, one minute. Fantastic horses that came through the sea, the black pepper bags that were carried away by the animals, the gems and gold from northern hills, sandal and aloe from the western hills, pearls and from the southern sea, the coral from eastern sea, the goods from Ganga and commodities from uh, Kaveri and the food from Sri Lanka. So that is a very uh, important reference that brings out the network as visualized by the poet about 1800 years ago. I'll move on to the final section. Can you move on to the final section, please? Next, please. Next. Yeah, so uh, I am coming to this uh, uh, final section where I am trying to argue how can we take away uh, take uh, this uh, particular uh, connections to, uh, uh, to the contemporary period? How can we make it relevant? So historical interactions for cultural relationship and people to people connectivity and awareness platform and social media and historical connectivity and education oriented initiative and also heritage networks for development. So these are the areas where we can work out and make the project more, so more relevant to the contemporary nations and communities. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah, uh, so uh, actually, uh, if you look into these uh, kind of, you know, soft power or uh, heritage diplomacy, we can find evidence for in Ashoka's mission, sending helps to Sri Lanka and the Greek country and also Chera Choda Pandian kingdom. So this is a very important uh, landmark, a very important dis uh, diplomatic mission of Ashoka from which we can learn a lesson. And uh, we have also evidence for a Trankupar project under undertaken by Danish uh, government. So such kind of projects, uh, collaborative projects need to be undertaken and these ideas need to be taken to the people through some uh, massive museums. Only then we can uh, succeed. So we need to have a very clear planning to take this uh, Asian heritage or Indian Ocean heritage uh, to the public through various uh, activities. So that forms as an important step uh, that we need to take. Next, please. Uh, awareness through digital uh, heritage, uh, through digital media and social media. We are actually doing a lot of efforts uh, right now. And uh, currently, we have a lot of information available. They are not available to the uh, public. They are available only in the reports or academic papers. I think we need to uh, write popular uh, books in various languages so that the rich maritime heritage can be understood by the people. It, is, it should not only be in English, it should be in the local languages. That is very important. Only by creating positive impact, only by creating awareness level among the public, it can be, uh, we can move on to, uh, you know, uh, move on to the next level and make the uh, project to succeed. And Recently, Archaeological Survey of India excavation that brought out some Shivalingam uh, from the site of Mysen and that was shared on the social media that created a powerful impact. So that kind of, uh, you know, collaborative uh, projects are very important. Next, please. Uh, yeah, okay, activity and education oriented initiatives. We need to reinvent all the uh, ideas, uh, idea, the things that happened in the past, like what happened in the Nalanda Vikramashila uh, universities of ancient India. And also, we need to reach out to the students, uh, mainly students from these uh, Indian Ocean re region of, uh, offering, you know, subsidized education or some kind of fellowships and also collaboration 
uh, and archaeological survey of india is there and their uh, ichr icssr they can provide fellowships i know already they are providing fellowships and it, this kind of focus uh, you know uh, they should make it into more afro eurasian rather than indians at least 10 or uh, 10% of their budget of fellowship it should be allotted so and private players also could be encouraged or roped into only by adopting these measures you know we can reach out to entire uh, afro eurasian world next uh, that is the that, final slide that, of my talk that, that a fellow uh, that a fellow Uh, yeah, I am finishing with this. So we need to have a network of archaeologic archaeologists, museum network, heritage network, so that proper uh, research could be uh, undertaken. So by creating these network knowledge networks, we can uh, really uh, proceed much. And uh, thank you for uh, listening. Uh, thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Salakumar. Uh, uh, now uh, we have. Right into the discussion time. Uh, we have got ten minutes before the session is closed. Uh, so we can extend it by five minutes. By three thirty-five, we can close the session. Uh, we can have fifteen minutes question answer. Yeah. Uh, we can see uh, the hands yeah. which have been raised. Mm. If you allow me to, you know, I can ask them to unmute and ask questions. If that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So. Uh, Professor Jayesh Vivekanandan from South Asian University has raised hand. Uh, Ma'am, could you ask your question? Yes. Um, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sankal. Um, my question for Doctor Yung Si Chai. Uh, I remind you to be prepared. And my question is related specifically to Singapore, from where you hail. um you made a brief mention of colonialism but your presentation i thought was largely based on the impact that british empire would have had on the poor in art uh, and just as post colony singapore's encounter with colonialism very unique um, in different generations say um we could be There, there is a lot of echoing, so um, I, yeah. I can't quite he hear your question. But um, would if anybody would catch it, you know, would you be able to, or write it down, or would you be able to explain it to me? Um, were you asking about, um, you know, kind of um, this um, rhetoric of colon colonialization in the Singapore Museum? Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Oh. Uh, thank you. You see, uh, would you like me to start at the beginning, or um, did you catch a bit of what I had said earlier? Caught the bit where you um, you talk about this, um, you know, Singapore is a British colony, and I lost you. After. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so I was thinking because uh, Singapore has a very conflicted approach to its colonial past. Mm. Um, I mean, its whole city landscape is dotted with statues of colonial figures. Mm. Uh, so, um, mm. how has heritage diplomacy reflected this conflicted identity? I mean. um to what extent is heritage diplomacy calibrated its orientation in a post imperial world i mean if at all um and the other question i had was i got a sense that heritage diplomacy seemed very linear uh, we know that heritage is the outcome of competing impulses of ob circulation of objects and their appropriation mm -hmm. in local context um so to what extent do you think these are reflected in um in heritage diplomacy it seemed very Have read you wrong. Um, thank you very much. Um, I I think um, you know. Thank you very much for your question. I think I, I re really appreciate that, and I fully agree with you that I think you know Singapore has a very problematic um, relationship with um, with uh, British colonialization, and I think uh, you know um, last year they had this um, kind of raffles in Southeast Asia exhibition that was criticised um, from left, right to centre. um this is you know i i think it's it's because of this um i think singapore at the moment like at least for the national museum um you know it has not been in my opinion they have not been able to actually unpack that that colonization relationship because colonization is you know ultimately a a kind of exploitative process 
Um, but you know, I think Singapore has been um, ha has been taking a very tokenistic approach to this um, this this idea of colonization, and I think that explains you know a lot of failing failings which I've highlighted just now. You know, the kind of um, you know the resistance to take a more contextualized approach to to explaining the the kind of circum collection collecting circumstances of its objects, etc. Um, but my sense is that you know with um, you know, and that brings me to the second point of heritage diplomacy. Um, I think you, you know, I think um, the point of my argument is that you know, heritage diplomacy so far, in terms of conceptual kind of um, um, rhetoric, it's been taken as a kind of you know. I think nobody questions the efficacy of cultural diplomacy. Nobody questioned efficacy of, you know, that that. That you know is often being invoked rather than explained. So my argument, therefore, is you know is to complicate this and basically to say that in, in my presentation, I I actually alluded to the fact that actually you know um, it's it's not um, you know with with those um, negative publicity on the tank ship wreck and also um, with this um, kind of sensitization of the approach to understanding those um, anthropographic collections. You know it 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 kind of um, you know. By avoiding some of these important conversations, it, it actually, you know, um, complicates the kind of impact of um, culture, um, heritage diplomacy or cultural diplomacy. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Commodore Johnson wants to ask a question. Sir, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is specifically uh, to Professor Uttara Sultan. Uh, uh, Especially, Professor, having heard uh, the concerns of uh, local political sensitivities, what uh, Jun said, and also of the uh, mention of the Eurasian, Euro -Af uh, Afro Eurasian construct. So, I agreeing with what you had talked about the new way of history and echoing, you use a term called seascapes and you use oceanscapes. How do we actually break this continental terrestrial approach to studying what is inherently oceanic? I mean, I was a practicing mariner before I have gone into scholarship. Uh, and my challenge is that those who are not at sea probably get to say more about what is about sea. Would you, as someone who's brought this thing, how do we really get the sea story into oceanic history? Professor Sutra. Thank you. This um, this actually warrants a much longer kind of discussion. But very briefly, um, there have been, um, not necessarily specifically in India, in South Asia, but there has been work on this maritime cultural landscapes, which I feel is a very valuable concept for archaeologists. It started off, uh, it emerged out of Westerdahl's archaeological work. And this necessity that you're talking about of not giving priority to the land, which we tend to do, right? We work on the land for the most part as historians and archaeologists. And therefore, uh, this is a concept that focuses on, a, um, to put it simply, a marine lifestyle throughout history, where people and communities are, and cultures are engaging both with the land, but also with the sea. And in that, we are talking about intangible landscapes, we are talking about ships, we are talking about trade, we are talking about all of this. And I think this is um, a useful concept. There have been lots of criticisms which we won't go into, but I think this is a way we can start thinking about these coastal communities, the people and the things and the ideas. And that's something we need to do, but um, I just want to add that it needs to be rooted in a disciplinary context. So we need to be very strong in terms of our research and our argument and then start building connections. So we need to have something substantial to say. Thank you. I'm sure we'll follow up bilaterally. This is interesting. Thank you. There are some questions in the chat box as well. Uh, they are not necessarily addressed to any particular panelist, but maybe <laughs> if they want to answer any of these questions, they can. Um, I think there's a question that is um, addressed to me about um, any detailed narrative of the ISPA rebel or, or rebe rebellion in um, Trinso um, Maritime Museum. Um, yes, um, there is. And I just, um, for those who are not familiar with the local contact, ISPA re 
rebellion is um, actually, uh, you know, um, a, a civil war in, in the 14th, 13th, 14th century in Trento that is um, led by these uh, Muslims in, in Trento against those, um, this um, um, Yuan dynasty. And yes, um, there, there is a passing reference of this, uh, this, this civil war in the museum. However, um, as I recall, um, you know, it was only in one or two, um, you know, small plots, and it was only mentioned in passing um, it to lead on to a bigger, um, you know, kind of description at the museum of this um, contemporary Islam Muslim communities in Trento, because many of these Arabic um, communities are persecuted, you know, during this um, this um, civil war, and as a result of that, some of them either fled Trento or they assimilated into those local population who, whose descendants still live in certain parts of Trento today. Yeah, and also I'd like to mention as a side point that, you know, today, um, you know, as I mentioned in my talk earlier, there have been some donations that's been given by Arabic countries to Chenzhou. And um, many of these is ironically built on this kind of relationship because, um, you know, of for example, I, as I understand the Kuwait, the former Kuwaiti ambassador to China, for example, um, had a dissent. Um, you know, has an ancestor that was buried in Trencho. And, you know, the museum draw on this kind of relationship to lobby, you know, um, the, the Arabic countries to actually um, um, donate to um, setting up this kind of um, Islamic wing at the museum. So, um, yeah, so, you know, that's, I think, an, another element of, you know, perhaps heritage diplomacy that um, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm also um, currently looking into. Thank you. Yeah, there are uh, uh, two questions to me. I'll uh, I'll answer. There is one regarding Pumbuhar. Actually, they have uh, Pumbu at Pumbuhar near uh, uh, Ka uh, Kaveri Pumbatinam or Nahapatinam Arche Archaeological uh, Department of Tamil Nadu. They do undertook some uh, underwater survey along with uh, Anivo Bova. They found some material, but not much. Pumbuhar as such has not been uh, located uh, uh, properly and uh, they have excavated, the Archaeological Survey of India has excavated a few structures, they have excavated a Buddhist stupa, otherwise not much of material of early period has come from the underwater. There is another question uh, from a person regarding the connection between megalithic bur burial of woman and uh, uh, India. This is also very difficult to answer. There are some similarities between the burials uh, as uh, suggested by several researchers. We need to undertake more uh, uh, research on this. The Kerala has certain uh, uh, distinct megalithic burials such as rocket caves, but we are not sure whether um, you know there was any connectivity in terms of megalithic burials. But yes, definitely uh, in the first um, millennium BC, Kerala did have connection. Unfortunately, we have not researched, as uh, Uttara pointed out, we have not researched on the prehistoric uh, period to understand the connections. We have evidence of uh, material coming up in West Asia, pushing back uh, connection to the early first millennium BC, I think that is the area we need to undertake research. Currently, we know uh, clearly that these interactions uh, took place somewhere around uh, four, 4th century BC based on the material evidence. For the connections prior to that, we don't have evidence except some linguistic, linguistic uh, terms which suggest a similarity in terms of boats or watercraft uh, names. So this is an area where we need to uh, focus uh, more. And with regard to East Africa, yes, uh, we don't have, again with the East Africa, we have not much uh, interaction with those scholars. We need to look at the material. I am sure we'll be able to find related where, whereas we have a lot of material uh, found in Red Sea coast. As far as uh, East Africa is concerned, we have not interacted with the uh, people. In fact, uh, if, uh, if some fellowship is offered to students who can undertake a doctoral or postdoctoral uh, research, if uh, some good students are selected through some kind of uh, you know, screening method and if they are offered doctoral or postdoctoral fellowship to work on these themes, mainly ceramic and material culture uh, through the entire afro eurasian world, that can really contribute. We have some thesis already. There's one Anjana Reddy who has uh, submitted a PhD on West Asian ceramics. There are few works 
uh, like that available. I think we need to mainly encourage younger generation to undertake research on uh, such topics by offering fellowship. That can really uh, contribute and bring in new data and also science-oriented work should be encouraged. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think with this we can close the session. Uh, we have two very good presentations in the session. Uh, first one was by Dr. Uttara. Uh, uh, she emphasized on the you know materials uh, through which we were looking for uh, connections. Obviously, that leads to dissemination of ideas. Uh, uh, she also said more uh, talked about the identifying more prehistoric sites on the coast, and also turning these pandemic situations into an uh, advantage for, for the archaeologists. Uh, she made a very interesting uh, suggestion, uh, uh, calling uh, ocean scapes instead of the landscapes. <laughs> and the second was was by Dr. Uh, Lucy. Uh, uh, she made a presentation Sorry, I, um, I couldn't. Involving Singapore and. Uh, uh, would you mind, um, you know, um, kind of para, um, kind of um, repeat your question because I Hello. think that the connection was lost. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a very, very good presentation. I was happy to see some uh, beautiful sculptures uh, in the museum uh, of uh, Lord Vishnu. Uh, the third one was by Dr. Snella Kumar uh, on the uh, Afro Euro Asian region, maritime activities and connection between these two regions. Uh, we emphasize that it, is, uh, it should be uh, uh, region oriented uh, uh, culture oriented uh, study and not site oriented uh, uh, research should be taken up and a very very exhaustive presentation about the uh, Tamil literature the sites the pottery the inscriptions or graffiti on the pottery um, out of we also had very good uh, uh, presentation and a very good uh, discussion. Uh, I thank uh, the ICWA and the IGNCA for inviting me to chat the sessions. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Namirajan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful discussion. Now we'll take a short break and we'll resume our next session at 3:45. Thank you. Thank you.